This morning evoked Frederick Law Olmsted and uh, some of the ways he's been identified with uh, the social and environmental transformation of the city. We evoked uh, Lawrence Halperin and his efforts at, at uh, more inclusive design processes. Um, we're in another episode now of, of design as activism. How likely, uh, the, these other episodes were waves. Um, and um, I think there's, a, there's a, a, a larger social question hovering here of whether we're at some sort of sea change in terms of the recognition of diversity, divergence, however we want to describe it. Um, you know, are we looking at, at a sea change within the practice of design here, or are we looking at another wave that may ebb? Do you have hope or confidence that we're really in, inscribing change in the DNA of, of landscape design, or do we, do we think this is another moment that might pass? I'm going to take a little more of a cynical approach to it and say that we are in a, well, a cautionary approach. I'm going to say that it could easily become just another flash in the pan instead of a moment of, of, of change. In 1988, there was an article about, uh, in LAM, I think it was 88, in LAM about uh, a handful of promising black landscape architects. And five years later, it was the same people. And then 10 years after that, it's the same people. So there's this sort of repetition and reliance upon pointing at one moment in time to say that there's this, there's this thing. And say, in the same way that uh, the ASLA constantly um, goes back to the keynote spe speech from 1968, and I cannot remember uh, the gentleman's name, where he basically called out the profession and said, you're basically useless and not doing anything in black communities. And then suddenly, community design becomes a thing, but then they're still referring back to this critical moment, but not doing anything beyond that. So I think it's more important not to say it's a change, it's a matter of being cognizant of the pattern and trying to find ways to get past it. So I think in that respect, um, you know, as, as a as an educator, I think it's what I teach and how I teach it and the language that I use to teach it. So when I say joy becomes an important thing, I'm really thinking joy needs to be the thing instead of beauty because it's more inclusive and it is, uh, it, it is uh, more embracing of different situations and people. And if we don't change those languages in the way we think, we will talk about this moment 20 years from now and say, oh, there were these moments and there was this conference, and what happened, right? Yeah, I want to get to this question of joy uh, because I think that's incredibly provocative. Um, but do others of you want to take a stab at this question of whether we're really at a sea change here or? I mean, I, I and speaking about like, queer identities and LGBTQ spaces and people, I think we have to look to the younger generation and more and more people are identifying as queer and it's like becoming more acceptable. And I think if you look back 10, 15, 20 years, like that wasn't an opportunity for people to be um, out in the workplace, to be bringing them their full selves to the profession. And so I think now that you know, we've seen kind of more movement um, within like the queer world and more acceptance, I think it's gonna be something that has to be talked about more and it's gonna be something that is brought into the profession just by um, people, students who are in the profession bringing themselves into um, firms and designs. I think it's gonna be a larger part of the conversation. And Danielle, have you seen neurodivergence become more of a f subject of discussion within firms or, or no, in the discipline more largely? I have experienced more people being more open about their own neurodivergence. I have lots of friends that have ADHD, and that helps with staying up late, night, late at night working <laughs> on drawings. <laughs> it does have its unique challenges, though, of course. But I'm thinking that maybe it's both things. Maybe we are at this moment in time, and we 
can't give up this momentum that we're building, and maybe it's about building solidarity with all of our marginalized communities. I think the hope is, again, in, in the carving of spaces that are raising the consciousness of these conversations to move into actionable opportunities, right? It, it's not that we haven't talked about queer spaces or underrepresentation of blacks in, in, in architecture or the inequities of our society. I do think we're at a very pivotal moment where there is a consciousness um, that is rising to understand within the greater ecology we're operating in that we must stand up. And to, to do that is to create um, the, uh, a disruption in the traditional approaches of how we, we identify professionalism and excellency and really begin to open the doors to say what's worthy of, of preservation, how we are different and that's the strength to our democracy ver versus that we need to recreate silos of, 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 of difference. It's saying the difference enhances our democracy and there's a reparations to our communities um, across this nation that need um, that type of thinking yeah. and support. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that struck me as really hopeful today is, is the extent to which so many different voices and so many different perspectives have, have been represented from indigenous peoples to people, neurodivergent people to queer space to African Americans, and um, and that seems to me um, a source of solidarity and strength. At the same time, we <laughs> we're facing incredible pushback, uh, and and uh, um, and and we've seen this over the last decade. It, it, you know that uh, this fight isn't over, um, and so yeah. Um, how do you? How do you cultivate or hang on to this, the, the value of joy or the importance of joy in the face of that kind of pushback? I mean, where does resilience come from within the, the sort of individual practitioner? It, it, it works a couple different scales. I mean, for me, the, the, the first scale are, are scholar, the scholarships and seeing these folks. And, you know, the first part of it is saying, or the obvious part is really saying this, we're awarding this person or recognizing these people for their accomplishments and the excellence, whatever that may mean, um, that they represent um, as individuals who are uh, students of color. But then there's this other side of it. So for those handful of people, there's a whole lot of more people that I, letters I read or just these interactions and, and just hearing about them and knowing they're out there and any opportunity that can push them forward is a moment that's really pleasurable and brings me joy and excitement. So there are a bunch of people here that I'm going to keep my eye out for you. <laughs> and if I see you, I'm going to lean in, ask how you're doing, make sure you're doing okay, and then we're going to try and get you get you out there, right? And then it becomes as something as simple as um, the bag of potato chips I have in my office that are to pull people in, right? How you feeling? You doing all right? Have you ever had Korean barbecue potato chip <laughs> from Canada? You have? Come on in. And having these really intimate moments and letting people relax and breathe, right? So then they know that they're being seen and that they have an opportunity to um, decompress and that they have some sort, some means of support. So those are the moments that, that are some of, like potato chips and hanging out with the students, with the Nomas students. Way too much fun. <laughs> I think that's really, that's super powerful, the being seen. That's super important for everybody in practice. I'm realizing that that is what happened with my colleague, and that's why we were so successful and why we've been so successful. You know? The, the importance of being seen and being heard. Yeah. I, I, I think that just building off of that energy of joy okay. um, and, and these intimate moments is what gives the hope of resiliency. And it's not identifying the agency of being invited as just a moment of kids, right? It, it, um, if kids, yeah, I'm tired. <laughs> it's not that moment of just um, students coming in, but I think it's how we do that in our everyday life, yep. um, in this work, and not just sectioning it off saying landscape architects or architects or planners. It's really creating the space that everyone starts to feed into that resiliency versus just the profession. Yeah.
Um, and uh, there's something, I think, joyful in this idea of seeing with two eyes <laughs> that we heard about this morning, mm -hmm. that you're, you're seeing things from your own perspective, but you're also seeing things from somebody else's perspective. And that that generates a kind of empathy that I think is a, 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 a potential source of joy. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. that feeling of connection that uh, people talked about uh, this morning as well. Um, I'm afraid that we're um, being encouraged to, to uh, vacate wrap the room. <laughs> uh, being encouraged to wrap up. Well, I thought we were going to um, crash the wedding. <laughs> <laughs> so... And so I'm going to turn this back over to Charles for some concluding remarks. And okay. Thank you, panel. Thank you. It was really wonderful. A number of the speakers today really spoke from incredibly personal places. And we're talking about the future of the discipline, whether this is a moment. I think the moments that really make a difference is when people speak from the heart. And those people that have the staying power, who, yes, you could be a great writer and an orator and a bureaucrat, but it's those people, like our laureate Julie Bargman, who have been um, so open, at times brittle. I did say badass, and I'm going to continue to say it. But truly, I think that it's those of us that open ourselves up in such a way that I think it serves as a connective tissue and a way for us to heal and to move forward. So to Julie and to all of our speakers, thank you for a glorious day.